Hello everyone, my name is Jensen Metcalf. I'm on staff here at the District Church. We're so glad that you could join us online this Sunday to hear the word of the Lord together. As a community, we're in a season that we're calling Multiply. We've been in this season for about a year now. Last year, we made our initial commitments to the Multiply campaign. We're really just believing that God is gonna do some amazing things in the midst of our community here in DC. We made that commitment last year, and then this year, just a few weeks ago, we re-upped our commitment. So we did another commitment Sunday. So if you didn't have a chance to re-up your commitment or even make a new commitment, maybe you haven't had a chance to make an initial one, we'd love uh, to give you the opportunity to do that. So you can follow the URL on the screen where you can go to an online commitment card and either recommit or make a new commitment to our Multiply season and just really be praying for our church and what God is doing in the midst. We're in a series right now called Corrective Lenses, and Pastor Amy is gonna bring the sermon this week again. And this week we're talking about sex. So before we get into the message, I wanted to give you all a PG-13 warning. Parents, if you're with your kids, uh, please, we're gonna leave it up to you to feel free to make that decision whether or not uh, they can listen in, but we are going to be talking about sex. We'll be talking about sexual trauma as well. Um, so there's a bit of a PG-13 warning for this week's sermon that we want to give you a heads up on. Before Pastor Amy preaches today, let's read the scripture together. The main text comes from 1 Corinthians 6, 12 through 20, and 7, 1 through 3. It says this, I have the right to do anything. You say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. You say, food for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy them both. The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and he will raise us also. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said, the two will become one flesh. But whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins are a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that you are, your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Now for the matters you wrote about, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. But since sexual immorality is occurring, each man should have sexual relations with his own wife, and each woman with her own husband. The husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife, and likewise the wife to her husband. Hello everyone, so glad that you could join us for the second week of this series called Corrective Lenses, A Vision for Relationships. We're bringing marriage, sex, and singleness back into focus through the corrective lens of the Word of God. Last week we talked about a vision for marriage, and before we dive into today's message, I want you to hear a testimony from a couple in our church about God's work in their own marriage. Take a look. My name is Ariel. My name is Geraldine. And we're coming up on seven years of being married. We started to have some issues or conflict um, right at the beginning, I would say the second year, and uh, also at around four, four, yeah, four years of marriage. 
I never felt the issues on our second year of our marriage, but when we were around year four is when I started to feel them. After we decided to work on that, and after four years, the same issue came back again. So we both agreed, okay, so this is it. So we, uh, we can't live with each other. So that's the end of the marriage. And, and we mentioned the word uh, divorce. I remember it was January 1st and I came to the Graham's house. And Aaron asked me how I was doing and I just told them we're getting a divorce. Then we also told our small group that this is not gonna work out. Just so you guys know, changes are coming. I think that was the beginning of the community that was around us coming together to fight for the marriage that we had given up for. One of the places where we sought help was by going to an intensive marriage retreat. One of the things that I learned from the beginning is that if one person in the marriage thinks that the marriage is not doing well, then it's probably true. That if one person is losing in the marriage, then both people in the marriage are losing. The turning point was um, after we came back from the retreat. I learned so much about myself. I felt like, oh my gosh, there is so much that I have to work on myself first. At first, I thought maybe going to the retreat, I'm going to like have someone fix him. But I realized that I actually, I have to fit, fix myself. Things today are a lot healthier in our marriage. Our marriage is more alert. And I use the word alert because when you're alert, you have to be on the lookout. And that requires intentionality. So I would say we're more intentional about compromising. We're more intentional about being self-aware of what we think and what we feel and being intentional about communicating it. We're alert that we're not creating a space where the other person doesn't feel safe to share what they think or what they feel. How things are today are more um, joyful, I would say. Like, I really enjoy his company. Um, I'm not saying that we're perfect and like, or we're, st like we're still working in so many things, and, but we're just working one thing at a time. We recently had our first born. Her name is Estela. She's six months old. And we're really blessed that God trusted us with her but we're also excited for the things that we're going to be able to teach her that we learned ourselves through our marriage about self-awareness and being able to communicate with others and being able to recognize and create safe spaces. Thank you, Ariel and Geraldine, for being vulnerable and sharing your story. I'm so glad that God worked in your marriage, keeping you two together and bringing Estella into this world. It was such a blessing to see their TDC community surround them, and as they said, fight for their marriage when they had given up. And it's been an honor to watch healing take place in their relationship. So if you find yourself struggling in your marriage, I strongly encourage you to reach out to me or to our counseling ministry so we can make sure you get the help that you need so that you're, you can thrive in your relationship. We partner with ministries to offer intensive counseling like Ariel and Geraldine received, but we also walk with couples preparing for marriage or just dealing with the everyday challenges of marriage. So if you're in need of help in your marriage, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Now, as we dive into today's message, I just want to reiterate that there is a PG-13 rating on this message, so please use your discretion. Now, when I was 12 years old, I was sitting around the lunch table at my elementary school discussing a very popular song at the time, Like a Virgin by Madonna. Those of us who were at the table, we weren't sure if being a virgin meant that you had had sex or you hadn't, but we all declared at 12 years old that we hadn't had it. Um, when I was 15, I had my first real dating experience. It was very respectful, kind, 
and pure. But at the age of 17, I was sexually assaulted and that changed everything. My innocence was lost and everything shifted. Now I've shared more details about that trauma in our Body Keeps the Score series that we did last summer. But suffice it to say that when sex entered my life, it was violating, criminal, and vicious. And it changed the trajectory of my life and my relationship with sex. I had wanted to live a life of purity, honoring God with my body and remaining a virgin until marriage. But instead, the enemy got a foothold in my life as a result of the sexual assault. And despite my best efforts, I was unable to remain sexually pure. What God has intended for our good, the beautiful gift of sex, the enemy has permeated our culture through abuse, addiction, selfishness, creating a twisted and distorted view of sex that is so far from God's original intention and design. Now, if this is your first time watching us online, welcome. <laughs> I'm really glad that you found us. Maybe this message got sent to you by your significant other, or maybe you just decided to long on to see what this message on sex is all about. Or maybe you knew we were discussing this topic and you wanted to hear more. However you have found us, I truly hope that you experience God's truth today in a way that brings about new revelation and piques your interest. I pray that the Holy Spirit would move in our hearts and our minds to help us experience God's grace, God's love, and His correction today so that our lives can be more fulfilled than we ever thought possible and we can experience the depths of God's love in ways we've never known before. That is my hope. We often think of the Bible as a helpful tool for life and guidance spiritually. But when it comes to sex, we often see it as an archaic text that does not relate to the sexual culture of today. However, when you read Paul's letter to the church in Corinth, you realize, as King Solomon said, there's nothing new under the sun. We titled this series Corrective Lenses because we actually believe that the Bible is God's word and it is meant to instruct us, shape us, redeem us and protect us from a world that is ruled by God's enemy who only wants to rob, kill, and destroy us. So we are hoping that God's word can bring our vision of sex back into focus and into alignment with his vision as the creator of this gift. God loves sex and he loves romance. He created sex for our enjoyment and our pleasure. Yes, he created it to help populate the earth, but sex is not just meant for procreation. It is meant for so much more. Now, last week I presented a vision for marriage and shared that the purpose of marriage is to be a tangible demonstration of God's love to a broken and dying world. Well, God's vision for sex fits within this purpose of marriage. Sex is the one flesh union that reflects God's vision for intimacy and oneness for us. God created sex for those who are married to experience unity, to bring new life into this world, to experience pleasure, and to bring him glory. Now, as a pastor, my purpose in this life is to help you get more freed, healed, and delivered. And I believe with the topic of sex, there is a huge need for healing, deliverance, and freedom. So with that in mind, I want to talk today about God's vision for sex and see how God's word can operate as a corrective lens for us. Now, this may be shocking coming from a pastor, but some of you who are married are not having enough sex. You need to have more. Others of you who are single, you want to have sex, but you're trying to live lives holy and pleasing to the Lord. And some of you, whether you're married or single, have a really twisted and warped view of sex, which may have been shaped by abuse, addiction, trauma, or today's culture. Regardless of which category you fall into, I want God to help give us a new vision for sex. 
Now, it's helpful to understand the context in which the scripture that we are looking at was written. So our passage for today that was read earlier is written to a young church in Corinth that was known to be filled with the Holy Spirit, operating in the power of the Spirit and witnessing the manifestation of the gifts of the Spirit. But the church in Corinth lacked character, morals, and strong ethics. They were a bit of a spirit-filled hot mess. So it's to this lovely group of passionate misfits that the Apostle Paul writes this letter. There are two worldviews and perspectives about sex present in this passage, and they are basically the exact same views that we contend with today, showing that King Solomon was right. There truly isn't anything new under the sun. If we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 12 through 13, we see the first worldview that Paul was addressing. It says, I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. The food for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy them both. These verses point to the view that sex is just an appetite. If you're thirsty, you drink. If you're hungry, you have a DC brunch with breakfast burritos and eggs benedict. If you're aroused, then you have sex with whomever you want, or you masturbate, and if you need to use pornography, then so be it. In other words, anything goes. There's complete sexual freedom to do whatever you want to do, with consent, of course, with whomever you choose. Sound familiar? The reality is sex is literally all around us. In the 1960s and 70s, the sexual revolution brought to life what the enemy always had bubbling underneath the surface. This movement was all about freedom and sex, especially for women. It promoted that we should be free from external rules and authorities and should rather do what brings us the most pleasure, as long as it is consensual between adults. That is all that matters. But I would argue the sexual revolution actually just wrapped people in spiritual and emotional bondage to addiction and pain. Of course, the sexual revolution was not the first of its kind. You can just study first century Greek culture to see how sexualized it was. But this revolution has been able to travel much more quickly across the globe and into homes because of the advancement of technology. That is unprecedented. When you combine the sexual revolution with the internet, smartphones, and video technology, you've got a complete shift and breakdown of the sexual ethic of our society. One of the fruits of the sexual revolution was the promotion of pornography. And the internet has only made this content more accessible today. Pornography is a sickness that produces a tremendous amount of shame and actually rewires our brains. Statistics show that the largest users of internet pornography are between the ages of 12 to 17 years old. This sexual revolution is now discipling our next generation of teenagers, teaching them how to fan into flame the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh. Internet access to pornography is about as easy as turning on a light switch. And with the availability of smartphones, you can view pornography anywhere you go. This is the culture that we live in. As Pastor John Tyson from New York City states, this is the first time that a generation of young people have been raised by marinating their brains in continuous violent images of misogynistic sex. It's completely destructive. This is why our Monday Night Men's Sex Addiction Support Group has been one of the most successful ministries of our church. Sex addiction is rampant, and as a church, we are desperate to see people set free and delivered so that we can be formed to be more like Jesus than like the world. Maybe you're not part of the one in 10 people who admit to being addicted to pornography, but then there are other things like hookup culture. With the rise in popularity of dating apps, hookup culture, swiping right and having sex with whomever we want, whenever we want, has almost become the norm. This applies to those inside and outside of the church. Hookup culture very much speaks to our society's desire to meet our needs any way we want to, no matter what it does to our souls. Then there's other lifestyle choices. If you were to look at the statistics around premarital sex, 
cohabitation, abortion, divorce, and even open marriages, which has alarmingly high rates in DC secular culture. It's clear that the sexual revolution is still gaining ground. We are living in a culture that very much embraces a liberal view of sex that says what we do with our bodies, at least as it relates to sex, doesn't really matter. And that having no boundaries means freedom. Well, there's one boundary that remains, that sex must happen between consenting adults. But everything else is fair game. 1 Corinthians 6.18 says, flee sexual immorality. When most of us hear this phrase, we almost tune it out because it sounds vague, unrelatable, or because we don't want to flee. We don't use the phrase sexual immorality very much today, but the Greek term that the Apostle Paul uses here is not vague at all. He says, flee porneia, which is obviously where we get the word pornography from, but he's not talking about pornography here. The Greek word porneia meant to have sex with someone you weren't married to. He used a word that meant any kind of sex outside of marriage, whether you're married or not. He doesn't just say it would be good for you to refrain from sex outside of marriage. He says, flee, run away from it, have nothing to do with any kind of sexual activity outside of the covenant of marriage. Paul continues in 1 Corinthians 6 verse 18 by saying, all other sins a person commits are outside of the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Now, if you grew up in the church, you probably heard the phrase that all sin is equal, right? Yeah, me too. And on one level, there is truth to the sentiment. All sin does, does separate us from the love of God. However, not all sin is equal in impact. The Bible teaches that sexual sin is actually a different kind of sin. Everywhere else it says resist temptation, but when it comes to sexual sins, it says flee sexual immorality, flee porneia, get away from any kind of sexual activity outside of marriage. Run away from it, get the heck out of there, don't go near it. Sexual sin does something to us that is very powerful, and memorable. When we see sex positively, it bonds us in a one flesh union and it allows us to experience one of the best physical feelings available to humans. But when we have negative experiences, they are extremely memorable and can warp our minds, confuse our bodies, and compromise our spiritual self. We remember sexual abuse and sexual assault. Our bodies keep the score of it and it often requires many years of hard work in healing and recovery. This battle between a positive experience and a negative experience with sex is a direct result of God giving us a beautiful and powerful gift, but because of the fall of humanity in Genesis 3, it means that sex is often used as an instrument of the enemy. So while we have sex as an appetite on one hand, and as one worldview that Paul was speaking to. On the other hand, we have the view that was present in first century Greco-Roman culture and also exists today, that was one of extreme fear. In 1 Corinthians 7, 1, Paul writes, now for the matters you wrote about, and he begins to quote the church that wrote him letters. It is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. Paul is responding to those who see sex as dirty, defiling, and thought of as just a necessary means of procreation. In other words, the view was holy people should abstain from sex, even those who are married, except for the necessity of procreating. This fear-based view was so prevalent in the church that throughout church history, there would be edicts to try and curb the appetite of sex, even among married couples. The church would declare that you must abstain from sex on Thursday, because that was the day Jesus was arrested, abstain on Friday, the day of Jesus' death, abstain on Saturday in honor of the Blessed Virgin, and on Sundays in honor of the departed saints, sometimes on Wednesdays and during the 40-day fast periods before Easter, Christmas, and Pentecost, also the feast days, the days of the apostles, and the days of female impurity. 
There was a theologian who estimated that there were only 44 days a year when husbands and wives were permitted to have quote unquote, God blessed marital sex. It's mind boggling comes from the fear-induced view of sex as defiling and dirty. So there are two views. Sex is just an appetite. It's completely natural to have sex with people whenever you want to. And then the other view, sex is dirty and defiling. You should stay away from it at all costs. These two views were present a couple thousand years ago, whole different culture, whole different time. And yet these two perspectives might still be the two biggest views of sex that exist today. One full of fear and the other has zero boundaries. Well, God does not ascribe to either view or perspective of sex because his word basically says that both of these views are absolutely wrong. God's vision of sex is that it is so amazing, such a mystery, and meant to be a gift to those in a covenant relationship that it should be held with highest esteem. God wanted the church in Corinth to see that the way that they were using their sexuality was destructive and inappropriate. When we embrace the liberal agenda that has been made popular with the rise and the success of the sexual revolution, engaging in sexual activity outside of a covenant of marriage, then it actually deforms us out of the image of Jesus and distorts us into the brokenness of the world. Therefore, the purpose of marriage is greatly diminished because the enemy has twisted God's gift of sex into something that is self-serving, casual, disintegrated, and detached. God's word does not ascribe to the perspective of fear where sex is dirty or defiling, nor does God ascribe to having no boundaries with sex. Instead, he holds a much higher countercultural and corrective view of sex. The biblical view of sex actually transcends the two world, world views that we see represented in scripture and in our culture today. The key to understanding the biblical view, this higher standard, is understanding verse 16 of this passage, which says, Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said, the two will become one flesh. When the Bible refers to two becoming one flesh, it goes beyond the physical exchange of bodily tissues and fluids. It is actually referring to a personal transformation that is happening. This is the corrective lens for us. The two will become one flesh. Theologian Anthony Thistle, who actually passed away last week, writes about this passage. Far from devaluing sex, Paul here is doing the very opposite. Paul was far ahead of first century assumptions in perceiving the sexual act as one of self-commitment, which deeply involves the entire person, not merely body parts. Paul is saying that sex is meant by God to be the full giving of one's entire self to the one to whom you belong. The full giving of one's entire self to the one to whom you belong. This is not the kind of sex or passion that Hollywood loves to put on display. It's all about the sharing of yourself with the one to whom you've chosen to belong. It's the giving up of your own agenda, your own will, and your own demands to share yourself fully with your spouse. Another theologian, F.F. F. Bruce, has this to say about the passage. Paul displays a psychological insight into sexuality, which is altogether exceptional by first century standards. He insists that it is an act by its very nature engages the entire person in a unique mode of self-disclosure and self-commitment. Essentially, this passage of scripture is setting forth a completely new and extraordinary perspective of sex, a corrective lens that raises the bar so much higher than where those in the first century were operating at the time and where we often operate today. God's design for sex says, you can't have physical oneness without whole life oneness. You must never get physically naked and vulnerable with someone without become vul becoming vulnerable with your whole life, naked and unashamed, as we give a nod to last week's vision of marriage. 
If you want to have sex with someone, you better be prepared to become legally, economically, socially, and emotionally committed in every way. In other words, are you ready to share your bank account, all your passwords, your dresser drawers, all your feelings, and your most intimate secrets, past and present? If so, then you're ready to have sex. You must be willing to give up your independence, your selfish ways, your own personal agenda, if you want to have sex the way that God intended. If you're giving of your body in the context of a whole life commitment, it will result in deep soul nurture and in deep personal transformation. So far, this may sound like a message geared towards singles, me trying to convince you to have a high view of sex and therefore remain pure. And while that might be partially true, this message is 100% for married couples. Every married couple knows that choosing to have unselfish and completely vulnerable sex within marriage is still a choice that you have to consciously make. Within marriage, some people approach sex as a chore or a responsibility that they have a duty to perform because sex is just a part of being in a healthy marriage. Others feel a sense of entitlement to sex because of the covenant of marriage or perhaps only feel loved if they are receiving sex. Both of these views need to be corrected through the lens of today's scripture. Selflessness, vulnerability, transparency, and generosity are all part of giving your whole self to your spouse. If I'm holding anything back, emotionally, physically, relationally, spiritually, then I'm not given my whole self. We live in a society in which it's considered normal to give your body without giving your whole self, to have sex and yet hold on to control, independence, and remain completely guarded emotionally. We compartmentalize sex, separating it from the rest of the person, from the soul, and we just see it as something to meet my needs in the moment. This happens with singles who engage in premarital sex and it happens within the context of marriage. But we see in this passage that this is completely opposite of what God's vision for sex is. God literally means that when two become one flesh, they are giving all of themselves to one another. Not just a physical transaction to meet a temporary appetite, which satisfies for a moment and is just left wanting more. Sex is meant to be the physical manifestation of an emotional, spiritual, intellectual, and relational reality of oneness and closeness that is truly only achieved through the covenant of marriage. Okay, Pastor Amy, so thank you for this theological and biblical lesson. But what does this mean practically for me? Well, I wanna to speak to two different groups of people, those who are married and those who are single. And if you're engaged, you're still single. If you're married, I'm on a mission to get you to have more sex. Now, of those who are married, one person in the coupling is like, yes, amen. The other person in the coupling is like, oh, heck no. Here's the thing, there's always one person in the marriage that wants sex more, always. And it's not always the man. All the single people are like, what is she talking about? I wanna have sex all the time. The reality is, within marriage, one person's drive is just stronger than the other person. This is normal. It helps create balance. It can also cause tension, which can, which can be really hard. But my hope is that if you're married, you would begin to understand that sex within a covenant marriage takes a lot of intentionality and work. If sex is a gift, and it's meant to be the demonstration of sharing your whole self, every part of you with your spouse, then God wants you to have it often enough that you're being reminded that you're sharing your whole self with one another. And if you need some inspiration and motivation, just read Song of Songs, chapter five. The reality is that sex reflects the oneness and unity that God desires for us. And therefore, we must seek as married couples to hold it in high regard, allowing sex to remind us that we are sharing our whole selves with one another and to be willing to help meet our spouse's needs within sex. Sex is a beautiful gift from the Lord, but we must actively resist the two competing agendas that the world offers us, choosing to embrace God's vision instead. 
Now, for those of you who are single, first of all, this sermon is not meant to bring about shame or condemnation on anyone. I started this message with my own story of brokenness and pain to help recognize there is a need for healing and deliverance for many of us. This sermon is simply to help us have a correct and biblical vision of sex in the way that God truly intended for it to be. Also, you do not need to have or experience sex to be a complete person or to be truly satisfied and fulfilled in this life. That is a lie from the enemy that is simply not based on God's truth. When you do have sex outside of marriage, you are dishonoring this incredible and powerful tool, tool that helps shape people into deep soul nurture and personal transformation. And when you give your body to someone without giving your whole self to them, then you're misusing this instrument of commitment. The enemy often uses sex as a distraction and a deterrent from keeping the calling God has on your life in focus. So when you engage in sexual activity outside of the context of a covenant marriage, the enemy is gaining ground and winning. Now, some of you single people may be rolling your eyes, crossing your arms in front of your chest as an act of defiance against the words that I'm saying. That's okay. I'm trusting the Holy Spirit to work in your heart. Next week, we're gonna hear a word on a vision for singleness, or we're gonna unpack what, unpack what God's vision is for those who are followers of Christ. But do not get married and seek to remain pure. It will come from someone who's single, not from me. The bottom line is this. God created sex to reflect the whole life oneness and unity that he desires for us. The enemy has done what he does best, rob and destroy. He has come into this world to twist, tear apart, and dismantle God's original vision for sex. As followers of Jesus, we must now intentionally work, whether we are single or married, to live a life that honors, upholds, and implements God's correct vision of sex. So if you're watching today, and you're married, and sex is a very sensitive topic in your marriage, or it's a place of tremendous, of a tremendous amount of pain, physical or emotional. I want to pray for you and your spouse to be vulnerable and truly trust, trust one another as you seek to be one flesh. If you've experienced abuse, trauma, or addiction, related to sex, and you are desperate for God's vision of sex to replace the pain inside of you. I wanna pray healing and deliverance over you. If you're single and you're a follower of Jesus and you're really struggling in your desire to remain pure and honor God with your body, I wanna pray for God's power to be made perfect in your weakness, for the fruit of the spirit of self-control to be so evident in your life and for you to experience such fulfillment with the Lord that you only long for more time with Him. I am believing God that today is a day of deliverance from the enemy's twisted lies, a day of healing deep wounds related to sex that have caused a tremendous amount of turmoil in our lives, and a day of freedom and renewal of our minds to allow the corrective lens of the Bible to give us God's vision for sex. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for such a beautiful gift that you have given us. I pray, God, that you would forgive us as a people, as a society, as a culture, who have allowed the enemy's uh, twisted and destructive views of sex to be one of our primary views. God, help bring us back into focus. Help us surrender to your vision for sex as it is intended to be within the context of marriage. God, I pray, I pray for healing, deep healing in marriages where sex has become such a barrier to oneness and intimacy. God, I pray for deliverance and healing for those who ex have experienced abuse, trauma, and addiction related to sex. 
God, would you stand with them? Would you help bring them renewal in their heart and their minds? And God, I pray over those who are single, who are desperately trying to follow you, who are trying to remain pure and follow your word, God. I pray that the fruit of your spirit of self-control would be very evident. I pray that in their moments of weakness, God, that you would be their strength. And God, I pray that they would find more fulfillment in their relationship with you, in their relationships with others as friends, then they would have a desire to engage with sex. God, we are desperate for the intervention of your Holy Spirit in this topic in our lives, whether we're married or single, whether we've experienced abuse or we've just been shaped by the culture. We are desperate for you to come in and change our hearts and our minds to see and think of sex more as you intended. I pray for your Holy Spirit to come and change our hearts and minds, to bring you honor and to bring you glory. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I want to thank you so much for joining us online today. We hope that you will join us next week as we hear a biblical vision for singleness. I also want to mention that uh, today's sermon was much more theological and biblically based, but if you want some practical tools for uh, sex within your marriage or as you are preparing to get married, I encourage you to check out Marriage Surrendered, the curriculum that we've created, um, as there's a whole session on sex. Now unto him who has called us to live according to his truth and biblical vision for our lives, we give all honor and glory in Christ Jesus. Amen.